the first step of the project was getting home two full sheets of plywood. One sheet was for the wall, and the second sheet was for the ripping of strips that were going to serve as the cleats. I added a 1 8 roundover to all the edges of the plywood just to soften it up a bit and make it a little less harsh. I wanted to make the cleats have a little bit of contrast compared with the wall that they were sitting on, so I covered one whole sheet of plywood with a coat of Danish oil, and then this was the sheet that I would ultimately rip down into the 45 degree angle cleats. This way the cleat portions would have some contrast against the other sheet of plywood which would serve as the backer wall for this French cleat wall. At this point I started ripping that sheet of plywood into 5 inch strips and then ultimately those 5 inch strips would be ripped in half with a 45 degree cut to give me two cleats, one for the tool and one for the wall. I realized that my table saw wasn't going to allow the tilt all the way to 45 degrees, so I ended up taking these strips up to my father's shop to do the rips at 45. Once I had all the strips ripped in half with a 45 degree angle, I laid down the other sheet of plywood that would serve as the backer wall, and again added a 1 8 round over across uh, all edges of the sheet of plywood. I then started laying out and figuring out the spacing between all the cleats. I started by clamping in position the very top cleat uh, as if there was a tool hanging on it positioned at the very top of the sheet of plywood and then located the bottom cleat accordingly and then moved down from there adjusting the spacing so that everything was even. I used inch and a quarter brad nails and tight bond wood glue to attach the rails to the wall and then also added screws later after all of the cleats had been affixed to the wall. It turned out that a 2x4 was the perfect spacer between each cleat, so I used that repeating all the way down the wall.
As I mentioned, I also used inch and a quarter general construction screws to secure each of the cleats to the wall. I also made sure to countersink the holes fairly well so that the head of the screw would sit flush or below the face of each of the cleats. I had my better half come out and join me in the workshop to do the heavy lift to get the wall in place. You'll see I put a, a cleat of sorts on the wall below where I wanted it to sit that we could rest it on once we lifted it up and then get it in position with that cleat holding it up on the wall and then attach it permanently and then I'll remove the cleat at the very end. I used a couple of 2x4s to wedge between the wall and the floor just as secondary backup in case that cleat failed that was holding the wall up until I had permanently attached it to my garage wall. I used three inch lag bolts to attach it permanently to the wall, it reached definitely far enough through the French cleat wall, through the drywall and into the stud. I also did a countersink again on all those so that the heads sat flush beneath the surface of the tool wall so all my tool holders would still slide in without a problem. And then the moment of truth as I removed that cleat from the bottom that was originally holding the whole wall up and nothing fell down, so mission accomplished. Now given that this is a video on a French cleat tool wall, I couldn't just leave you here. I do show you a few of the tool holders that I made to get started on the capacity of the wall. Uh, but there are a million different variations that everybody can make on their tool holders. And really, they're all custom made to whatever tools you have and what your needs are. Uh, I'd love to hear from all of you as to what your favorite design has been for a French cleat tool holder. If you want to leave that in the comments below, I'd love to get an idea of other tool holder ideas. Uh, but there are a few that I put together real quick. This first one is a rack that holds all of my orbital sanders. And here I'm just measuring the final width of this tool holder so that I could cut a cleat to the appropriate length and attach it to the back side.
The next tool holder that I put together was a rack to hold all of my parallel clamps. I used the drill press to drill out round holes at the end of the racks. And then I used my jigsaw to cut out the spaces between each of the holes in order to allow the parallel clamps to slide into position. I used the oscillating spindle sander to help knock down some of the unevenness from using the jigsaw as well as soften up the sharp edges on the corners of the plywood. And now for the lessons learned segment of this episode. Some of these may seem pretty obvious to you, but I consider myself a fairly intelligent guy and uh, found myself making these very easy mistakes. So keep these in mind as you try this kind of project. Number one, check the cleat position before you glue and nail it to a tool holder. Um, there was one where I didn't really think about what I was doing and just attached it and it was on the wrong side of the tool holder. So hold it up to the wall as it's going to lay against the wall um, and make sure you have it oriented correctly. Number two is check your triangle support that it's under the structure on a tool holder rather than on the side. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the clamp racks. The first time I built one, I put the triangle support on the side of the tool holder rather than under the structural support. And really, you're losing a lot of the strength when it's attached to the side rather than underneath. Number three is check the angle of your brad nails when you are nailing. Uh, as I was putting these together on my workbench, there was one or two that accidentally went down into the workbench. Luckily, I didn't do the entire perimeter of a tool holder that way. Otherwise, I would have had it permanently attached to my workbench. So keep that in mind. Uh, too much angle, you're going to be nailing to whatever is underneath. And number four, uh, depending on the kind of plywood you're working with, don't sand these too much. Otherwise, you will sand through that first layer of veneer, uh, and you'll get a funny look if you have odd spots of different color veneer showing through. So just go real easy on the sanding touch-ups on the corners. Thanks so much for watching this episode of CCS and Sons. If you haven't already, be sure you hit that subscribe button. If this was at all enjoyable to you, hit that thumbs up button. And thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next episode.